Lecture 13, Medieval Education. As with the Crusades, Catholic education during the medieval age has frequently been misrepresented. A common way this occurs is by labeling the medieval time as dark ages when the intellect was fettered by church control. When examined carefully, this narrative is quickly recognized as false, while of course acknowledging that there were some dark elements within this time, as there have been dark elements and dark aspects of all ages. Within all ages, we will carefully examine medieval education by studying monastic schools, cathedral schools, and universities. Some of the greatest minds came out of these centers of education. Monastic education. During the early medieval age, various schools existed. Two primary educational institutes were the monasteries and the non-monastic clerical schools. Some of the most important monastic schools were Tours in France, Jaro in England, Fulda in Germany, Monte Cassino in Italy, Iona in Scotland, and Clonmacnois in Ireland. Up until the 9th century, only boys interested in becoming monks were allowed into the monastic schools. After the 9th century, mon monasteries began educating those who were not discerning a vocation to their monasteries. In his book, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God, Jean Leclerc glowingly describes how monastic education undertaken at these monastic schools were not only concerned with growth in knowledge, but also growth in sanctification. In contrasting monastic education with the scholastic education in cathedral schools and universities, which replaced the educational leadership role that monasteries provided, Leclerc writes, and I quote, The two theologies draw in common on Christian sources, and both enlist the aid of reason. Scholastic theology has recourse more frequently to the philosophers. Monastic theology contents itself more generally with the authority of Scripture and the Fathers. But the fundamental sources in both cases are the same. Theology is a method for reflecting on the mysteries revealed in Christian origins. The question now before us is to learn if there are several ways in which this reflection may be practiced, and if amongst them there is a mode of reflection more appropriate to the monks. The texts themselves have led us to confirm that what individualizes monastic thought is a certain dependence on experience. Because scholastic theology, on the other hand, puts experience aside. It can subsequently hark back to experience, observe that it agrees it with its own reasonings, and that it can even receive nourishment from them. But its reflection is not rooted in experience and is not necessarily directed towards it. It is placed deliberately on the plane of metaphysics. It is impersonal and universal. In that very fact resides both its difficulty and its grandeur. It seeks in secular learning and philosophy for analogies capable of expressing religious realities. Its purposes is to organize Christian erudition by means of removing any subjective material so as to make it purely scientific. As for the monks, they call, as if spontaneously, upon the testimony of the conscience, upon the presence within them of God's mysteries. Their principal purpose is not to reveal the mysteries of God, to explicate them or derive from them any speculative conclusions, but to impregnate their whole lives with them and to order their entire experience to affect their mode of reflecting and for this experience itself to become in large measure the matter of their meditation. These two modes of religious understanding are, in the original meaning of the word, complementary. Monastic theology is, in a way, a spiritual theology which completes speculative theology. It is the latter's completion and fulfillment. It is the added something, the sorsum in which speculative theology tends to transcend itself and become what St. Bar Bernard calls an integral knowledge of God, integer cognoscere. Cathedral schools. Cathedral schools, overseen by bishops, were also gradually established during the medieval age. At first, the teachers of at the cathedral schools were the bishops themselves. As the church membership grew during the 300s to 400s, a class of clerics called Scholasticus were delegated with the role of teaching 
that properly belongs to the bishops. Since a good number of these clerics had been formally trained in classical literature, they began to broaden the curriculum of medieval education as we will see in the following section on universities. In time, the cathedral schools surpassed the monastic schools in educational leadership. During the 11th and 12th centuries, the leading cathedral schools were in Paris, or Orléans, Chartres, Liège, Toledo, and Utrecht. The scholasticus are known for their educational approach that is known, that is called scholasticism. In contrast with the monastic edu approach to education, where growth in the spiritual life is central, in the scholastic educational model, this often was not central. Since in its origins, monastic education was undergone by monks or those discerning to be monks. Naturally, monastic schools integrated prayer and study more than the scholastics did. According to the Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, the scholastic, more abstract, logical, and systematic approach may be the explanation why, during the scholastic times, there were relatively few saintly theologians. Of course, there were some, such as St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Bonaventure. In describing this phenomena, Balthasar observes, and I quote, In the whole history of Catholic theology, there is hardly anything that is less noticed, yet more deserving of notice, that the fact that, since the great period of scholasticism, there have been few theologians who were saints, we mean here by theologian, one whose office and vocation is to expand revelation in its fullness, and therefore whose work centers on dogmatic theology. If we consider the history of theology up to the time of the great scholastics, we are struck by the fact that the great saints, those who not only achieved an exemplary purity of life, but who also had received from God a definite mission in the church, were mostly great theologians. They were pillars of the church, by vocation channels of her life. Their own lives reproduced the fullness of the church's teaching, and their teaching the fullness of the church's life. End of quote. Medieval Universities As cathedral and what Gangel and Benson called professional schools continued to expand, bishops once again delegated part of their role as overseers. They did this by appointing chancellors who were to supervise the faculty. At the same time, teachers and students began to form themselves into educational guilds based on the apprentice and master model of trade guilds. The combination of these factors led to the term universitas to be used when referring to schools of higher education. The 12th century mendicant orders, in Latin means meaning begging or property-less orders, of the Franciscans and Dominicans helped along with secular teachers to staff the universities with highly educated teachers. St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure, both lived in the 1200s, are two examples. They studied together as students at the University of Paris. Along with Paris, major universities of the 1300s were located at Montpellier, Oxford, Cambridge, Salerno, Bologna, and Lisbon. In 1231, the University of Paris was given even greater autonomy from the local bishop when Pope Gregory IX in his papal bulls Parens Scientiarum permitted it to be relatively self-governing. According to the bull, the University of Paris had the privileges of creating statutes and punishing according to these statutes. The Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa also greatly aided the developing educational scene when in 1155 he issued the Constitution Authentica Habita. Laws instituted by the promulgation of the Constitution protected students and scholars when they were traveling to and from foreign lands for academic reasons. <coughs> if they acquired debt, the Constitution had a set of laws to ensure they were treated in a just manner. As a further way of protecting students, Authentica Habita gave students the option to be tried by teachers or courts overseen by the local bishop. Teachers taught and students learned according to a basic curriculum template that the universities inherited from antiquity. The program of study was divided into seven ways. 
The first three ways, or roads, according to the literal meaning of the Latin title trivium, dealt with language, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. The second four ways, called the quadrivium, were comprised of subjects that had a pronounced mathematical component to them, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. In the 1200s, these seven educational roads, vias, were increased to include philosophical studies, specifically the study of nature, metaphysics, and moral philosophy. Universities often specialized in a few of these disciplines without totally neglecting the others. The University of Paris, where both Aquinas and Bonaventure were educated at, was famous for its logic and metaphysic classes. The rise of the universities meant that there was significantly less emphasis on studying for personal spiritual growth, so characteristic of monastic education. Instead, scholars aimed at grasping concepts rationally, and the ordering their acquired and ordering their acquired nature acquired knowledge in a highly systematic, logical manner. An inherent danger with this approach was identified by Pope Francis, who warned about studying God to obtain, I quote, answers to all questions. On this point, the Holy Father stated the following. If a person says he has met God with total certainty and is not touched by a margin of uncertainty, then this is not good. For me, this is an important key. If one has the answers to all the questions, that is the proof that God is not with him. It means that he is a false prophet, using religion for himself. The great leaders of the people of God, like Moses, have always left room for doubt. You must leave room for the Lord, not for our certainties. We must be humble. Uncertainty is in every true discernment that is open to finding confirmation in spiritual consolation. In the just stated quote of the Holy Father, two types of theology are referred to, cataphatic and apophatic. The word cataphatic comes from the Greek word kata, meaning to descend, and phane, meaning to speak. Cataphatic theology, therefore, is an attempt to bring God down to the level of our intellects, to speak about him in a humanly understandable manner. This is not necessarily wrong to do. It becomes disordered when an academic does so without humility. The word apophatic comes from the Greek word apophasis, meaning denial. In apophatic theology, the theologian speaks about God by referring to what he is not. Both ways of theology can be distorted if one is stressed to the exclusion to the other as the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, when explaining unity and perfection in God, states, and I quote, when, therefore, the truth prays to the Father for those faithful to him, saying, I wish they may be one in us, just as we are one, this word one mean for the faithful a union of love and grace, and for the divine persons a unity of identity in nature, as the truth says elsewhere. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. As if you were to say more plainly, you must be perfect in the perfection of grace, just as your Father is perfect in the perfection that is His by nature, each in His own way. For between Creator and creature there can be noted no similarity so great that a greater dissimilarity cannot be seen between them. Pope Francis's predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, as Cardinal Ratzinger, also warned against a theology that is excessively cataphatic. When this occurs, the Catholic faith becomes understood more as a problem to be solved and less as a mystery to be believed in. In a 1985 interview with the Italian journalist Vittori Massori, he asserted the following, and I quote, The only really effective apologia, that is defense, for Christianity comes down to two arguments, namely, the saints the Church has produced and the art which has grown in her womb. Better witness is borne to the Lord by the splendor of holiness and art which have arisen in the community of believers than by the clever excuses which apologetics has come up with to justify the dark side, which, sadly, are so frequent in the Church's human history. 
If the church is to continue to transform and humanize the world, how can she dispense with beauty in her liturgies? And in all of her life, that beauty which is so closely linked with love and with the radiance of the resurrection. No. Christians must not be too easily satisfied. They must make their church into a place where beauty and hence truth is at home. Without this, the world will become the first circle of hell. Massori further relates that Ratzinger spoke, and I quote, of a famous theologian, one of the leading figures of post-conciliar thought, who admitted without a qualm that he felt himself to be a barbarian. He comments, A theologian who does not love art, poetry, music, and nature can be dangerous. Blindness and deafness towards the beauty, beautiful are not incidental. They necessarily are reflected in his theology. End of quote. Why Ratzinger is so concerned that not only theologians, but all people develop a capacity for recognizing and appreciating beauty is because beauty can lead us to God, above all, moral beauty, which is highly attractive, as people who have encountered saints can testify to. In his typical, insightful manner, Ratzinger explains that the early church father, Ignatius of Antioch, identified moral goodness directly with Christ, since in Greek the word krestos means good, while the word Christos means Christ. Ratzinger adds that when Christians are persecuted, I quote, the conspiracy of the Christos is a conspiracy of those who are krestos, a conspiracy of goodness. Thus Tertullian asserts that the word Christ comes from the word for goodness. In the thought of Ratzinger, theologians need to be open to aesthetic beauty and to moral beauty. When this occurs, their theology will reflect the beauty and goodness of Christ and help draw people to God. A possible example of a scholastic from the time we are studying, who in many ways failed these requirements set forth by Ratzinger, is Peter Abelard. He lived in 1079 to 1142. Abelard was a French medieval scholastic theologian who systematized theology in his dialectical theological work Sic et Non. In Sic et Non, Abelard gathers together contradictory statements from church fathers and from Christian theology and then attempts to reconcile the apparent contradictions. He did much of his academic work as a master at the Cathedral School of Notre Dame de Par of Paris. While there, he became excessively attracted to the physical beauty and intellectual beauty of a young woman named Heloise. In his own words, he describes what he intended to do, and I quote from Abelard himself. Now, having carefully considered all things that usually serve to attract a lover, I concluded that she was the best one to bring to my bed. I was sure it would be easy. I was famous myself at the time, young and exceptionally good-looking, and could not imagine that any woman I thought worthy of my love would turn me down. But I thought that this particular good girl would be even more likely to give in because of her knowledge and love of letters. Through the written messages we could send one another, we could be together even when we were apart. We also could write some things to each other more boldly than we could ever speak them, and so could always be carrying on some very pleasant dialogues. I was all on fire for the girl, and needed a way I could get to know her on a private and daily basis to win her over. So, I approached her uncle, through some of his friends, and arranged for him to take me as a lodger in his house, which was right next to the school. I would pay whatever he asked. I easily got her what I wanted. On top of this, he begged me, actually begged, and was beyond anything my love could have dared to hope, to take complete charge of the girl to spend all the time I had free from school teaching her night and day. The simplicity of the man just staggered me, staggered me, as if he had set a ravening wolf to watch over a lamb. Those are Abelard's words. After Abelard took up residence in her uncle's Fulbert's residence, Abelard and Heloise became intensely in love with one another. Their love led to a pregnancy, after which Abelard married Heloise secretly. When their marriage became public, though, Heloise denied she was married to Abelard. Her uncle reacted by having men break into Abelard's room to castrate him. 
And as Abelard relates, I quote, They cut off the parts of my body with which I committed the wrong they complained of, and then they fled. In disgrace, Abelard became a monk at the Saint-Denis Monastery in Paris. Scholasticism and Art We will conclude this lecture with a glance at a new style of art that was beginning during the age of the scholastics to replace the older, more formal and stylized Byzantine style. The Florentine artist Cimabue was one of the most important artists of the time who broke away from the iconographic Byzantine style of, that was known of the time. Cimabue's example was further developed by a student Giotto di Bondone, and in the transcript I provide you a number of examples of a Byzantine style, Cimabue's artwork, and Giotto's artwork. God bless.